So welcome everyone to another quarter of Games and Interactive Media. We now do this seminar series for the sixth quarter, I think. Um, great turnout. Uh, it's increasing every quarter. More people come. That's great. Um, at the beginning, I want to thank a few people who helped organizing. First of all, Henry Lowood, who is there, who always finds great speakers. And then Martha and the people from MediaX, who, I mean, as you can see here, also help organize. And particularly, they um, uh, take uh, the videos and put them online. Typically, it takes about a week. And then go to the MediaX website, and you can watch the talks uh, afterwards uh, as well. Um, for those of you who take this uh, as a one unit uh, class, um, what you have to do is basically attend eight of the, of the lectures. There's a sign-up sheet here, which I'm going to pass around. If you miss more uh, lectures than that, pass me an email and uh, give a good reason, OK? So um, and that brings me to uh, our first speaker today, um, Shane Denson. So we're here. He um, is our newest faculty in the Stanford Arts and Arts History uh, Department. He just uh, joined uh, this summer. And uh, throughout his career, he was uh, both at Duke University and also spent some time in Hanover and in Germany. And his research interest and also teaching interest uh, spans a variety of areas. Um, in particular, phenomenological and media philosophical approaches to film, digital media, comics, games, and serialized uh, popular forms. And what this means, I think he will explain in his talk. So welcome. Okay, okay. thanks a lot, Ingmar, and thanks for coming out. Um, so. Yeah, I want to talk about seriality and serialization processes in games and gaming communities. And I want to discuss a sort of a digital humanities approach to this kind of study. So seriality, of course, is a familiar feature of game franchises. Mario, Zelda, Pokemon, Tomb Raider, and the like are constituted not so much in games as in series of games, complete with sequels, spin-offs, tie-ins, and other forms of continuation. But beyond this more visible form of seriality, the serial character of games is operative on a number of levels. It informs social processes of community building among fans, while it also takes place at much lower levels in the repetition and variation that char characterizes a series of game levels, for example, or in the modularized and recycled code of game engines. So in what follows, I want to consider how digital tools and methods, including so-called distant reading and visualization techniques, might shed some light on these processes and provide a bridge between the various levels of seriality in digital games and gaming communities. The vibrant modding scene that's arisen around the classic Nintendo game Super Mario Brothers from 1985 will serve as my case study. As I'll try to demonstrate, automated reading techniques allow us to survey a large collection of fan-based game modifications while visualization software helps to bridge the gap between code and community, revealing otherwise invisible connections and patterns of seriality. So the larger context for these considerations is my research on seriality as an aesthetic form and as a process of collectivization in digital games. This comes out of a project titled Digital Seriality that I co-directed from 2013 to 2016, so just until a month ago, with Andreas Zudmann of the Freie Universität Berlin, um, which in turn was part of a larger research network called Popular Seriality Aesthetics and Practice, which was funded by the German Research Foundation and based in Berlin. So this interdisciplinary group brought together researchers from literature, media studies, um, and cultural anthropology, among other disciplines, to study seriality in popular film, television, print media, and digital forms from the 19th to the 21st centuries. For the most part, though, this work was not done in the framework of digital humanities, though some might argue that all humanities work today is de facto digital humanities. But beyond that, I think there's some good substantive reasons for doing seriality studies with digital data-driven tools. To begin with, seriality challenges methods of single author and oeuvre or work-centric approaches as serialization processes unfold across oftentimes long temporal frames and involve collaborative production processes, including not only team-based authorship in industrial contexts, but also feedback loops between producers and their audiences, which can exert considerable influence on the ongoing serial development. Moreover, such tendencies are exacerbated with the advent of digital platforms, 
in which these feedback loops multiply and accelerate. For example, internet forums are established or monitored by serial content producers, and perhaps more significantly, there's real-time algorithmic monitoring of serialized consumption on platforms like Netflix. Likewise, the contents of serial media are themselves subject uh, to unprecedented degrees of proliferation, reproduction, and remix under conditions of digitalization. Accordingly, an incredible amount of data is generated in production and consumption so that it's natural to wonder whether any of the methods developed in the digital humanities might help us to approach phenomena of serialization in the digital era. In the context of digital games and game series, the objects of study, both the games themselves and the online channels of communication around which gaming communities form, are digital from the start, but there's such an overwhelming amount of data to sort through that it can be hard to kind of see the forest for the trees. As a result, visualization techniques in particular seem like a promising route to gaining some perspective or for establishing a sort of first foothold in order to begin climbing the mountain of data. Also of interest are distant reading techniques, as famously elaborated by Franco Moretti here at Stanford, um, which might be adapted to the objects of digital games, as well as tools for network analysis, which might be applied in order to visualize and investigate social formations that emerge around games and game series. So before elaborating on how I've tried to employ these approaches, which I'll do in a second, let me just say a bit more about the framework of my project and the theoretical perspective on digital seriality that Andreas Zudman and I have developed. So our starting point for investigating serial forms and processes in games and gaming communities is what we call interludic seriality. That is, the serialization processes that take place between games establishing series such as Super Mario Brothers 1, 2, 3, and so on. For the most part, such interludic series are constituted by fairly standard, commercially motivated practices of serialization, expressed in sequels, spin-offs, and the like. Accordingly, they're a familiar part of the popular culture that has developed under capitalist modernity since the time of industrialization. So on this level, level at least, there's lots of overlap with pre-digital forms of seriality as expressed in serialized novels, films, TV shows, and so on. But games also introduce new forms like what we call intraludic serialities or processes of repetition and variation that take place within games themselves. <coughs> For example, in the eight worlds and 32 levels of Super Mario Brothers. So here a general framework is basically repeated while varying and in some case increasingly uh, difficult tasks and obstacles are introduced as Mario searches for the lost princess. So following cues from Umberto Eco and others, this formula of repetition plus variation is taken here as the formal core of seriality. Games can therefore be seen to involve an operational form of seriality that's in many ways more basic than while often foundational to the narrative serialization processes that they also display. On the other hand, this low level seriality is, ma is matched by higher level processes that encompass but also go beyond the realm of narrative, beyond even the games themselves. So paraludic seriality involves tie-ins and crossovers with other media, including the increasingly dominant trend towards transmedia storytelling, aggressive merchandising, and the like. Clearly, this is part of an expanding commercial realm, but it's also the basis for a social superstructure, itself highly serialized, that forms around or atop these serialized media. As fans take to the internet to discuss and play their favorite games, for example. In itself, this type of series-based community building is nothing new, though. In fact, it may just be a niche form of a much more general phenomenon that's characteristic for modernity at large. Benedict Anderson and Jean-Paul Sartre before him have described, described modern forms of collectivity in terms of seriality, and they have linked these formations to serialized media consumption and those media's serial forms. So according to these thinkers, newspapers, novels, photography, and radio have effectively serialized community and identity throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. 
Interestingly, though, in the digital era, this high-level community forming or community building seriality is sometimes folded into an ultra-low-level infraludic seriality, a level that's generally invisible and that takes place at the level of code, for example. This enfolding of community into code, broadly speaking, is what motivates the enterprise of critical code studies when it's defined by Mark Marino as an approach that applies critical hermeneutics to the interpretation of computer code, program architecture, and documentation within a socio-historical context. Critical code studies holds that lines of code are not value neutral and can be analyzed using the theoretical approaches applied to other semiotic systems, in addition to particular interpretive methods developed particularly for the discussion of programs. Critical code studies follows the work of critical legal studies in that it its practitioners apply critical theory to a functional document, document or computer program to explicate meaning in excess of the document's functionality, critiquing more than merely aesthetics and efficiency. Meaning grows out of the functioning of the code but is not limited to the literal processes the code enacts. Through critical code studies, practitioners may critique the larger human and computer systems from the level of the computer to the level of the society in which these code objects circulate and exert influence. So basically, I'm interested in, in the possibility of crossing this perspective, critical code studies, with the tools and methods and perspectives of digital humanities and observing the consequences for a critical investigation of digital based a digital game-based seriality. So my goal in the undertaking is to find a means of correlating formations in the high-level superstructure with the infraludic serialization at the level of code, not only through close readings of individual, of individual texts, but by way of large collections of data produced by online collectives. So as a case study, I've been looking at romhacking.net a website devoted to the community of hackers and modders of games for mostly older uh, platforms and consoles. So community is an important notion in the site's conception of itself and its relation to its users, as is evidenced in the site's about page. So here we read, romhacking.net is the innovative new community site that aggressively aims to bring several different areas of the community together. First, it serves as a successor to and merges content from romhacking.com and the Whirlpool, other communities that went before it. Besides being a simple archive site, romhacking.net's purpose is to bring the romhacking community to the next level. We want to put the word community back into the romhacking community. You get the idea. Community is really central here. So among other things, the site includes a vast collection of Super Mario Brothers mods. And at the time I collected the data, there were 206 different hacks, some of which includes, uh, included several variations. There's more now. I think there's like 249, something like that. So these are fan-based modifications of Nintendo's iconic game um, from 1985, which substitute different characters or add new levels or change the game's graphics, sound, or thematic elements. Right? So they kind of perpetuate an unofficial serialization process that runs parallel to Nintendo's own official game series. And they establish in this way the basis of communal formations through more or less direct manipulation of computer code, either in the form of assembly language, hex code, or mediated through specialized software platforms, including emulators and tools for altering the game. In other words, the social superstructure of serial collectivity gets inscribed directly into the infraludic level of code, leaving traces that can be studied for a better understanding of digital seriality. But how should we study them? Even this relatively small sample is still quite large by the standards of traditional close reading based criticism in the humanities. What would we, what would we be looking for anyway? The various mods are distributed as patches. They come in the form of IPS files that have to be applied to a ROM file of the original game. The patches are just instruction files indicating how the game's code is to be modified by the computer. As such, the patch files can be seen rather abstractly as crystallizations of the serialization process. 
If repetition plus variation is the formal core of seriality, then the patches are the records of pure variation, waiting to be plugged back into the framework of the game, which is the repeating element. But when we do plug them back in, then what? We can play the games in an emulator, and certainly it would be interesting, but extremely time-consuming to compare them all in terms of visual uh, appearance, gameplay, and interface. Or we can open the modified game file in a hex editor, in which case we might get lucky and find an interesting trace of the serialization process, such as the following. So here we find an embedded infratext in the... Uh, in the code itself. So this is a game called Millennium Mario. It's a, it's a mod of, the, of Super Mario Brothers. It's a mod by an unknown hacker reportedly dating back to January 1st, 2000, but that may or may not be quite accurate. Um, but note in particular the reference to a fellow, fellow modder here. There's a kind of a shout out. It says, you know, hey, look, empty space. Well, you can thank Toma for doing this, right? So there's a shout out to someone else who's already been working on this game and somebody's picking up on it. And then there's some kind of skewed ASCII art down here. And then I just be I just love being so leet, right? 1337. So all of these are signs of a community of serialization operating at a level that's subterranean to gameplay. But this example also demonstrates the need for a more systematic approach as well as the obstacles to systematicity, for at stake here is not just code, but also the software that we use to access it and other broadly paratextual elements, including even the display window size or view settings of the hex editor. So in a sense, this might be seen as a first demonstration of the importance of visualization, not only in the communication of research results, but also in the constitution of research objects themselves. In any case, it clearly establishes the need to think uh, carefully about what it is precisely that we're studying. Serialization is not imprinted clearly and legibly in the code, but is distributed at the interfaces of software and hardware, gameplay and modification, code and community. Again, I follow Mark Marino's conception of critical code studies when he asks, what can be interpreted? And he answers, everything. The code, the documentation, the comments, the structures, all will be open to interpretation. Greater understanding of and access to these elements will help critics build complex readings, uh, will help, uh, yeah, build complex readings. Within, uh, within critical code studies, if code is part of the program or a paratext understood broadly, it contributes to meaning. In addition to symbols and characters in the program files themselves, paratextual features will also be important for informed readers. The history of the program, the author, the programming language, the genre, the funding source for the research and development, be it military, industrial, entertainment, or other, all shape meaning, although anyone reading might emphasize just a few of these aspects. The goal need not be code analysis for code's sake, but analyzing code to better understand programs and the networks of other programs and humans they interact with, uh, organize, represent, manipulate, transform, and otherwise engage. But especially when we're dealing with a large set of serialized texts and paratexts, this expansion of code and the attendant proliferation of data exacerbates our methodological problems. How are we to conduct a critical hermeneutics, as Marino calls it, of the binary files? their accompanying readme files, the ROM hacking website as a whole, and its extensive database, all of which contain, informa uh, contain information that is relevant to an assessment of the multi-layered processes of digital seriality. So it's here I suggest that critical code studies can profit from uh, this combination with digital humanities methods. So the first step in my attempt to combine them was to mine data from the ROM hacking website and paratext distributed with the patches and to create just a basic spreadsheet with relevant metadata. And on this basis, I started trying to analyze and visualize the data with um, a visualization program called Tableau. Right, so this yielded some basic information that might be relevant for assessing the serial community. For example, the number of mods produced each year, including upward and downward trends over the years, 
um, a list of the top modders in the community and a look at trends in the types of, of mods or hacks that are being produced over the years. But the visualizations themselves were clearly not very interesting or informative on their own. So it became clear that in order to bring this kind of high-level metadata to bear on code-level serialization processes, I'd have to find a way to collect some data about the code itself. The mods themselves basically just diff files, right? They just record differences that are supposed to be implemented in a file. Um, could be opened and compared with uh, the diff function that shows you the, these differences that powers a lot of digital humanities based textual analysis. So I mean, think of uh, Microsoft Word and you have the compare documents uh, function. That's a diff analysis, right? Um, but doing that with, uh, with these mods wasn't quite so practicable. Um, the hexadecimal code that we can access here and the sheer amount of it in each modded game which consists of over 42,000 bytes, which is not a, light, not a lot, but when you want to open it and compare the differences, it is kind of a lot. Um, it's not really particularly conducive to analysis with these existing tools. Many existing hex editors also include a diff analysis, but it occurred to me that it would be more desirable to have a graphical display of differences between the files in order to see the changes at a glance. So my thinking was inspired by a program called HexCompare, which is a Linux-based uh, visual diff program for quickly visualizing the differences between two uh, binary programs. But the comparison there is restricted to local use on a Linux machine, and it only considers two files at a time. So if this type of analysis to, is to be of any use for seriality studies, it'll have to assess a much larger set of files and or automate the comparison process. So this is where some colleagues from uh, Duke University's visualization and interactive services stepped in, and they helped me to develop an alternative approach. Um, Eric Monson um, from the visualization interactive services, he wrote a, a little script in Python that analyzes the mod patches and records the basic diff information that they contain. So the address or offset at which they instruct the computer to modify the game file, as well as the number of bytes that they instruct it to write. So with that information, a much more useful and interactive visualization can be created. So following a suggestion from Angela Zoss, um, I've used Gantt charts here uh, to represent the size and location of changes that a given mod uh, makes to the original Mario game. So it's possible to see a large number of these mods at a single glance. I'll show you in a minute. I know this doesn't make sense yet. But you can filter them by year, by modder, by title, or even by size. And in this way, we can begin to see patterns emerging. So these are patterns of where the changes occur in all these different games. I'm comparing here. I mean, I don't know how many are on this screen. But basically, I'm comparing all of them and you can start to see where changes occur, you know, where modders make changes to the original game. So, um, yeah, so in this way, um, we kind of bring a sort of distant reading to the level of code in accordance with uh, my argument that researching seriality requires an oscillation between sort of uh, big picture and micro level analyses or between distant readings of larger trends and detailed comparisons between individual elements or episodes in the serial chain. But to complete this approach, we still need to correlate this code-based data with the social level of online modding communities. And so for this purpose, I used initially, I used um, a tool called Palladio, which is a tool explicitly designed for digital humanities work. And it was um, made by the Humanities and Design Lab here at Stanford. So I use that to graph networks on the basis of metadata contained in the readme.txt files that are distributed alongside the uh, patches. So here, for example, I've mapped um, the references or the shout outs um, that, ma that modders made to one another in these paratexts, thus revealing a picture of digital seriality as a kind of imagined community of modders. And here, on the other hand, um, I've mapped some paratextual references to various online communities that have come and gone over the years. 
So we see um, early references down here to uh, Tech Hacks, which is a, a long defunct site. And then as we get closer, we see Zophar's domain and ACMLM's board, etc., all the way up to up there somewhere. I think it's here, romhacking.com uh, or .net, which is the community that I'm ex you know, explicitly looking at here. So as an example of how the social network and code level uh, analyses might be correlated, um, here I have filtered the network graph over on this side um, to show only those modders who refer in their paratext to Super Mario Brothers 3. Right, so this brings kind of an interludic seriality, right? a serialization process that takes place between games like Super Mario 1, 2, and 3. Um, it brings that to bear on their para and infraludic interventions. So the resulting graph reveals a small network of actors whose serializing activity involves mixing and referencing between Super Mario Bros. 1 and Super Mario Bros. 3, as well as between each other. So the screenshot on the right then selects um, just these modders and reveals possible similarities and sites of serialization within the patches that they're creating, which can then be sub uh, subjected to closer scrutiny with hex compare or tools derived from the modding community itself. So for example, we find that the modder AP's um, Super Mario Brothers, so let's see, AP is up here. So these are the mods by AP. Um, that, so AP's Super Mario Brothers 3 inspired patches from September 2005 and Flame Panther's SMBDX patches from October 2005. So let's see, where is Flame Panther? Uh, yeah, so this one, right, you can start to see that there's some similarities occurring in some of the places there. So there's, there's this uh, possible overlap that then you can look at in more detail. All right, so the modern insect duels, I mean, I won't go into all the details, but uh, there's more overlap between insect duels, Afterworld 8 mod, which is one that's kind of referenced by a lot of these people in the community, um, that shares large blocks around 31,000 to 32,000 uh, bytes with many of the prolific modder Googies mods, right, which also sort of have a, a characteristic signature. So of course, recognizing these patterns is just kind of the beginning of inquiry. From here, we still have to resort to a kind of a close reading um, and to tools that are not con conducive to this kind of broad view. So uh, more integrated tool sets kind of remain to be developed. But nevertheless, these methods do seem promising as a way of directing research are showing us where to look in greater detail and revealing trends and points of contact that would otherwise remain invisible. So finally, um, by way of conclusion and to demonstrate what some of this more detailed work uh, looks like, I wanna go back to this Millennium Mario mod that I showed you briefly earlier where we had this kind of skewed ASCII art with, it turned out to be a mushroom or something. Um, so as we saw, there was, there was this infratextual shout out and the ASCII art in the opening section of the hex code, right? And in the ASCII representation of the hex code. So with Tableau, with this visualization uh, software, we can filter the diff view to display only those mods that exhibit changes in the first 500 bytes or so of the code, right? Where those things actually occur in the, in the patches. And so here, that's what I've done. I've filtered it and I'm showing it just in greater resolution, basically. Um, and here we find two distinctive visual matches, namely between Millennium Mario, um, which is the, the bottom one marked here green, and this other one by Ray's side, Super Mario Brothers uh, Remix 2 from 1999. Um, yeah, as well as another match or similarity between these two that are circled here in red. Um, ATA's Super Mario Brothers Yoshi's Quest and Krillian's Mario Adventure 2, both from the year 2000. So the latter two mods, while clearly different from the former two, also exhibit some overlap in the changes made to the first 20 bytes or so of the patch. So 
those are the ones that I want to compare now. And so I open these up with a hex editor, in this case, this um, hex compare. In order, uh, so what I want to do here is to determine if the content of the changed addresses is also identical. Right? The visual match that I identified a second ago, that only tells us that something has been changed in the same place in those different uh, game files, but not whether the same change has been made in that place. So here we find that Rayside's Super Mario Brothers Remix 2 uh, does in fact uh, display the same changes in the opening bytes, including the reference to Toma and the ASCII art. So here I'm comparing these side by side. This is the Super Mario Brothers Remix 2, and this is the Millennium, um, Mario Millennium game that I originally found this in, right? So this then is a clear indication of infraludic serialization, the borrowing, repetition, and variation of code level work between members of the modding community. So this essentially serial connection, an infraludic or an infraserial link, would hardly be apparent from the level of the mod's respective interfaces though. So this is what they look like at the level of code, or at least this little uh, excerpt of the code, but this is what they look like if you open them up to play them. You would never guess that there's this kind of borrowing going on, right? So when we compare Millennium Mario, uh, just to show you the other two that I uh, singled out there for comparison, when we compare Millennium Mario with uh, ATA Super Mario Brothers Yoshi's Quest, um, we find the ASCII art gone on the right, despite the visual match uh, when I just visualized the, the differences, right? It showed me that there were differences occurring in the same place, but they're not the same um, changes being made here. So Yoshi's Quest, uh, this other game, Yoshi's Quest, does correspond in this respect to Krillian's Mario Adventure 2, and thus we have another clear indication of infraludic serialization which would hardly have been evident other than by means of a directed filtering of the large data set in conjunction with a close analysis of the underlying code. So again, this is really just the beginning of the analysis or more broadly of an encounter between a kind of critical code studies and a digital humanities approach um, to serialization processes. Um, ideally, the data set would be expanded beyond just this one website. Um, and other online communities would be mined for their data. Um, and above all, more integrative tools would be developed for correlating social network graphs and diff maps, um, for correlating co uh, community and code, basically. So perhaps a crowdsourced approach to some of this would be appropriate. And for what it's worth, you can find a lot of, well, you can find all of the data, and you can find most of the visualizations as well as some other visualizations on my website, uh, shanedenson.com. If you just do a little bit of searching, it doesn't take long to find it. But the, the real work, I suspect, lies in building the right tools for the job, and this will clearly not be an easy task. Uh, like digital seriality itself, this is work in progress, and thus it remains work to be continued. So, thank you. Thank you.